Why is no one talking about freelancing? No one is talking about this thing that is set to overtake traditional employees in the workforce. There will be more independent contractors than there will be employees in the next 10 years when I started working on this talk. And so that was the angle that I went in with. You work hard in your business. On the Profit by Design podcast, we ask the big question. What has your business done for you lately? Hi, I'm Dr. Sabrina Starling. I'm the business psychologist, the author of the Four Week Vacation and the How to Hire the Best series, as well as the founder of Tap the Potential, where we coach entrepreneurs like you to design sustainably profitable businesses that give you more time for what matters most and more money in your bank account than ever. Because after all, we believe work supports life, not the other way around. Weekly on the Profit by Design podcast, we bring you tips, tools, and strategies from our own experiences and from the experiences of our guests who are entrepreneurial thought leaders and real life entrepreneurs, all to support you in making intentionally profitable and sustainable business decisions to live the lifestyle you desire. Profit Designers, the four-week vacation, the entrepreneur's ultimate guide to taking your life back from your business is now available. Go to fourweekvacation.com, grab a copy of the book, and be sure to follow the steps there to claim your bonuses. When you purchase the book, you are eligible to join me for my upcoming live training, the four-week vacation, better business, better life jumpstart. Plus, and you'll also get an invitation to an exclusive VIP closed door training with me to identify the true profit potential within your business. Just follow the steps at fourweekvacation.com. And I hope that the four week vacation book inspires you for what's possible. It's time to take your life back from your business. Hello, profit designers. We are joined today on the podcast with Laura Briggs, and I'm tickled pink to have you here, Laura, because there's so much that you can offer and share with our profit designers. And I just want to give a quick introduction to let everyone know the expertise that you bring with us. Laura Briggs is a teacher turned entrepreneur. She's an author and expert on the freelance economy. She's given two TEDx talks on how freelancing is changing the workforce. And she's the author of five books, including The Six Figure Freelancer. So Laura, welcome to the Profit by Design podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So I want to share, Laura and I have been introduced by our mutual colleague, Melissa Swire. She's on both of our teams. And so just to kick that off, I think that's a great example of the freelance economy in terms of Melissa supports both teams. She's building her business. You support freelancers at Tap the Potential. We support business owners in getting more and more off their plate. And so there's a lot of interesting things that we can dive into and discuss. One area that I want to go to first is around, there's been a lot of conversation on the Profit by Design podcast about building a personal brand and branding and really creating that visibility as to, you know, why it's important as an entrepreneur to have a brand yourself and for your business and how do you start getting the word out? So you have a lot of expertise around this area. So I'm just going to kind of open this up. How did you come to be interested in understanding PR and the importance of building PR initially on your own? And what is it that you have learned that has really made the difference? Yeah, I think it came about by someone coming to me and asking to do a story about me way back in the day. For the first couple of years of my business, I was completely a ghostwriter behind the scenes, creating blogs, website copy, and content like that for my clients. And I really didn't coach other people at that time. I really was just figuring out how to run my freelance business myself. And I had an editor from Business Insider reach out to me and say, hey, we'd really like to talk about your story of going from a teacher doing doing seventh grade and becoming a six figure freelancer and having this career in business that follows you throughout your husband's military moves. And so I was like, well, this is great. I don't even have a website, right? Like I didn't need a website. I totally relied on word of mouth and my LinkedIn profile.
while. So I rushed to build a website really quickly just for that one business insider feature. And I really saw the power of that because when that was published, I got some really good opportunities and it laid the foundation for other work. And I saw that I could really get my kind of thought leadership out there talking about how freelancers should build their business, why businesses needed to hire freelancers, and really the potential that this had for remote work and flexible work. And so it really grew very slowly and organically from there. But I think it's still, it's so important today. Like a good portion of my marketing today is really built around the PR and the visibility because that's how people come to see you as credible. It opens you up to new audiences and it also generates direct business in your company. Yeah. So you had a very grassroots start. Like you built your career in freelance because your spouse was moving with the military and you were looking for, it sounds like you were looking for how can I use what I'm passionate about and do it in a way that's not tied to a geographic location. Yeah. I was a teacher and I had planned to become a professor. I was in a PhD program at the time. I had passed all of my qualifying exams. I only had the dissertation left. And I thought, okay, we're going to start moving. What skill sets do I have that I can pull from, right? Research, writing, editing, communication. I kind of looked at everything I had and tried to find a more flexible career that would align with that. And so I started freelancing just as a side hustle and it grew. And I saw that that would be a lot easier to take with me than trying to get recertified as a teacher in every new state. And we wouldn't always be moving with the timing of the beginning or ending of a school year. And I just saw the challenges with that. So it ended up being something that interested a lot of other people for different reasons, right? A lot of other military spouses, a lot of people that I used to teach with who were burned out, other graduate students who were seeing that the academic market wasn't great either upon graduation. And so I saw that there was a story here. And I think that's really important for visibility. What is your story that can help other people? Because we often think about it as being like, oh, I want to be featured in XYZ. And that's great. You should have those goals. But what gets a journalist's attention and what gets a reader's attention is how your story, your perspective, your proprietary process or product helps them solve a problem. And I think that's really one thing I've always stayed focused on in my visibility is like, how does this help somebody else and get their attention and make them feel like it was a useful investment of their time to read it or to consume it? Absolutely. I think as an entrepreneur, one of the most powerful questions we can carry around in our head is who am I talking to and how can I solve a problem? For them, particularly if it's in relation to, you know, our top clients and the type of people we want to attract into our business. And if we apply that mindset to PR and we think about, okay, this journalist is not a client, but this journalist has needs and he's an influencer over the clients that I want to reach. So I need to think through what does this journalist need and how can I create and take pieces of my story and background and put it in a package that speaks to the journalist and attracts the readers because that journalist is looking for readers and audience and that kind of thing. And so how can we take what we've experienced and put it into that light for that journalist? The other piece that I really want to highlight in your own story for business owners who are looking to hire, because I talk to business owners every day, multiple times a day, and hear about the hiring challenges and how hard it is in an in-person business to bring in talent. And I want you as a business owner to listen what to Laura is sharing her background. She was in a doctoral program. And she repurposed her skills to be a freelancer. And you're talking about large, vast numbers of people who have high, high levels of training and qualifications who, for whatever reason, are looking for something different and they don't want to go down a traditional career path and work in the corporate environment. There are people like that out there everywhere, lots and lots of talent. And it's an opportunity for us as business owners to look at what are specific needs that we have in our business that don't require someone full time. And we can actually bring in high levels of expertise in a very specific role and pay a certain amount of money. And 
when you bring in a freelancer, you're bringing someone who is an expert so they can accomplish things faster, more efficiently. They can come in and advise you on things that you don't see. Cause that's, you know, I always wonder what is it that I don't know that I don't know. And I want someone to tell me someone who's an expert who can tell me here's what's possible that you may not be seeing Dr. Sabrina. And I think freelancers provide that level of expertise that can be so beneficial. Absolutely. And I think they come at it from a different perspective too. And we all like, we're not doing this job or working with a client because we have to. The freelancers that I work with are all intermediate and advanced freelancers. They choose to do this because they love it. So they don't feel locked into a job or stuck working with you. They're showing up and doing these services every day because they love doing it or they love working with you or both. And so that can bring a whole different energy to your team as well. And that fresh outside perspective where maybe the in-house team is stuck in a little bit of a rut or isn't seeing some different angles of this. And that freelancer is sort of a fresh pair of eyes to look at things. Yeah. So let's circle back to the visibility piece. What is it? I know you talked about the story, but how do you determine what is it that others really care about hearing from you? Yeah. I mean, so part of it is to talk to the people that really know your target audience well, right? So every time that I think about when I'm going to be published as an expert on freelancing, I think about what are the pain points that the freelancers in my audience have? They're worried all the time about finding clients, charging the right prices, navigating this world where no one has trained you to be a freelancer or a business owner. There is no class in college that teaches this. All of a sudden you are a CEO and an entrepreneur and you have to figure all these things out. So knowing your target audience's story and pain points will really help you create material that is relevant to the audience members and also to that journalist or reporter or that editor who has to approve your pitch because it shows you've already done your research and you're saying, hey, there's an audience out here of people that need to hear this particular message and it isn't being covered in other ways. I think that's another thing that's really important, right? That's one of the reasons that I went after a TED Talk is I'm like, why is no one talking about freelancing? No one is talking about this thing that is set to overtake traditional employees in the workforce. There will be more independent contractors than there will be employees in the next 10 years when I started working on this talk. And so that was the angle that I went in with is like, Hey, everyone is missing this story. This is a huge thing. That's going to be a game changer. Right. And this was pre pandemic. Right. So you kind of have to be prepared to make the case of, yes, this is already happening. The data is coming out. We're seeing that people want flexibility. They want to work remotely. They don't want to be tied to a desk or a position nine to five. And when you can make that case, I think that there's a great opportunity there to connect with reporters and people in the press and also with your end audience too. Yeah. So I'm blown away when you say in the next 10 years, there will be more independent contractors than employees. I'm not at all surprised to hear that because even before the pandemic, I was hearing a lot from people who wanted more flexibility and that's what they valued most in their workplace. If they worked in a business that offered flexibility and the opportunities to work from home when possible, that's a highly valued trait in a workplace for an A player. So talk to me a little bit about what should our business owners be aware of with this shift that's coming? Yeah, I think it's to always be willing to consider a freelancer as an option. And there's a lot of ways that you can use freelancers where it doesn't disrupt from your traditional workflow or your in-house team that you may have on the payroll as actual employees. But There are so many benefits to working remotely and working as a freelancer that by saying, I never want to work with that, or I'm demanding that this position be an employee, you're immediately shutting all of those potential solutions out and you're decreasing your talent pool significantly. So always be open to it, right? Hire the right person for the job and make sure that the person matches the role really well, but don't exclude yourself from the possibility that a freelancer may may be able to do it better, the same for the same amount of money for less, right? There's so many options now. So think of it from that perspective of I'm exploring my options and I want to see if this is going to potentially work. I think the other thing that this is so important and so many business owners get it wrong. 
do not treat your freelancer like an employee. Not only is it illegal, but it is the easiest thing for us to go red flag alert. I'm out as a freelancer, right? If you start expecting me to be on call, you're adding me to 10 weekly meetings where I need to show up a bunch of where it's disrupting my work with the rest of my clients. I automatically know that that isn't a good fit. So know how to work with a freelancer. They're freelancing because they value their flexibility, their freedom, their client choice in who they get to work with and who they say no to. So understand that as a business owner going in that you can't just treat them like another employee or like they're not a valued part of the team either, right? You have to strike that balance between this is an outside person and I can't treat them exactly like my full-time worker, but I also want them to be included enough so that they understand our company culture and our company story and where they fit into the bigger process. You know, I will tell you on the Tap the Potential team, we are comprised of employees, which we call team members and independent contractors, which we call team members. And the, what I notice about our culture that I think in part exists because we have independent contractors on the team is those independent contractors treat tap the potential and our employees, everyone here like clients. And that is a whole different experience to have people on your team who treat us as clients, because what we do at tap the potential is we want to serve the heck out of our clients and we hire and bring on independent contractors around our immutable laws. So we have intentionally brought on contractors who have a heart for serving and our team members, our employees also have that heart for serving. So there's this servant basis, I think that exists, like one of our other immutable laws is be a gift from your gifts. And so we're always asking that question of what's needed here. How can I show up and support? And if we start treating, I believe if we treat employees like the traditional way employees are treated and independent contractors the traditional way. We are undermining significant culture opportunities and collaboration. We all bring expertise to the table and remembering that and looking at how can we show up and serve here, I think it just makes things so much stronger. And so I would just encourage business owners, if you have independent contractors, start thinking about them from the perspective of this is collaboration. They're not my employee. I'm not here to give tasks. And I also, I'm curious about your perspective on this, Laura. Is it better to delegate results or tasks? It really depends on the role that you're assigning out, right? So someone who is a copy editor or a virtual assistant is going to be very task driven. Tell me what it is that I need to do. If you're hiring a copywriter, a digital marketing strategist, and a paid ad specialist, these are all people who walk that line between, yes, I do the tasks, right? But when I'm on a job as a digital marketing professional, I also put on my strategist hat all the time. And so I think think it's okay to kind of blend that when you see someone working in one of those more strategic roles or in a higher level role, right? So like even working with Melissa is a great example. She started as my executive assistant and obviously had a ton more potential than just completing tasks. And so I saw this is a chance to move you into the role of online business manager where you'll still be doing some tasks, but you also can own some results. So when you're doing marketing projects, let's track things like my email subscriber growth and the performance of my email email list and how many people are opting in because that helps us to track back those tasks to actual results. And so a lot of times it's a blend, but sometimes you really do just need a person who can execute on tasks. And that's usually your admin person or something like that. Yeah, exactly. There's such a similar path here because when Melissa started with us, she was an executive assistant, very quickly has gone into our connect team lead, which is our marketing person. And she's responsible for results. And I feel confident in saying to her, here's what we're looking for. I trust you. You go figure out how to do this. There's still some tasky things that she's doing, but I think that's to the opportunity that we have from a building our team, we can bring people in as independent contractors at a level that we're comfortable with. And then we, they show us what they're capable of. And we have that opportunity to bring them into higher level roles with more responsibilities. So from the perspective of freelancing and building a team, 
team of freelancers, because I think this is another thing that business owners may not be aware of. When you hire a freelancer, oftentimes we think we're hiring one person. We have some freelancers on our team who have team members who support their work with us. And that's something I've really come to value because I always want people on our team working from their personal sweet spot. So like we have someone who came on our team as an online business manager, and she actually has other team members who handle some of the more rote, basic, tasky things that she doesn't enjoy doing. And so she does the higher level thinking. And I, I think that is such a huge asset because we're bringing in more brain power. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll have to think about this as a business owner when you're outsourcing, because there are some freelancers who say, no, I do all my client work myself and I want to stay in that role. And there are others who do treat their business more like an agency. And one may be more appropriate for you than another. So if it's important to you to feel like, right, like some of my clients as a writer, they want to know, are you writing my content or are you outsourcing that? And that's important to them to know that it's me that's doing the work. Whereas others say, listen, and I just want this job to be done well and I want to leverage that other brain power. So that's okay if it goes to other people on your team to handle a specific thing. Or it, the other thing that can happen too is sometimes like as a writer, my clients will come to me and say, hey, we're making an ebook. Can you do the graphic design? And I'll be the first to say, trust me, you don't want to buy anything that I've designed. I'm a words person, but I am partnered with this other person who has graphic design expertise. We can come together on this project and I can price it out as one rate for me to manage the graphic designer getting it done, or we can partner and they can charge you separately. And so that's the great thing about this. It's the same thing that attracts freelancers is the flexibility. As the business owner, you can say, what's going to work best for me? What's going to bring the best results for me and my team? And then try to find the freelancer who matches that. I love that. So you've already started giving some pointers about things we should ask or consider if we're going to bring in freelancers. What are some other things that we could do to make sure we're bringing in someone who's a good fit for our team and our culture? I'm so glad you're asking this because a lot of times when people are hiring freelancers, the focus is on the results. Can this person do the task? Do they have the expertise to execute on what I need them to execute for? But overlooking personality and culture fit can be a big mistake. It's not a big deal if this is like someone that you hire for five hours a month to do some, you know, clean up in your email inbox. That's not as vital as maybe like this person is attending my weekly team meetings. This person is contributing contributing to my business in a bigger way. Personality is really important. So I like to not sort of give clues about what my best style is. But when I'm hiring a freelancer, I will ask, how do you best receive instructions? Because I best give instructions via video. So if the person tells me I need written documents, I'm like, oh, we're not a good <laughs> fit, right? But I don't want them to tell me what they think I want to hear, right? Yeah. And so I also ask them, like, tell me about your best clients. What do they have in common? I'm listening for what's important to them so that I can tell that this is really key for them to be on my team, that they're going to fit in well too. And I listen for that collaboration, right? Because I have an existing team. It's a small team of three independent contractors, but they work really well together. So I don't want to be the one who adds in number four. And then the other three are going, this person's a nightmare. <laughs> we can't work with them, right? Yeah. So ask your team too, what's important? What's hard? What is hard for you about collaborating with someone? But yeah, definitely ask the question about how they best receive instructions and how they best receive feedback too. What do you want direct feedback? Do you need, like, does this person need a lot of coaching? Are they going to bristle and get defensive when you give them feedback? I think those things should never be overlooked in the process. Yeah. And I can speak from the school of hard knocks when you say, you know, ask your team and involve your team in the decision-making process, because I have hired an agency in the past that was not a good fit with the rest of the team. They were a great fit for me and my personal style. I was trying to extricate myself out of being in the middle of all of that. So that meant they were dealing with my team. And I hadn't paid enough attention to work style and personality. The core values were there, but the work style and personalities clashed and that caused some problems. So I think that's a really important point that you're making there about that. So as we think about bringing on freelancers into our business, what are some examples of 
things that freelancers can take off of our plate, because I'm always talking about business owners, get those $25, $50 an hour activities off your plate so you can really work on your highest and best value contribution in the business, which is what I call your $10,000 an hour activities, things that really move the needle forward. What are some examples of things that freelancers can do? Yeah. So start by thinking about your the trifecta of what to outsource is it doesn't make you money to do this thing. It takes you a long time to do it, or you hate doing it. If you've got a task that meets all three of those things, outsource it immediately. That is like, you're not in your zone of genius, which you were just talking about, right? So I think a common one that pops up first is the things that a virtual assistant or an admin can do, managing your calendar, managing scheduling. If you produce a podcast, the behind the scenes of the podcast production, organizing all the guests and getting headshots and all of that, those things can really relieve a lot of initial pressure and are really good like training wheels kinds of tasks because what you don't want to do is go out and say, all right, this is my first time hiring a freelancer. Let me hire a marketing expert or someone that's an OBM at a very high level because you may not have your hiring processes or training and onboarding down just yet. And you may not get it right. And then kind of convince yourself that, well, this doesn't work. Freelancers don't work. Outsourcing is a nightmare. So I'm not going to do it. Other things that are really common to outsource graphic design, copywriting, web design, social media management is a huge one, right? That can save you a lot of time. Basically, you want to be looking at any of the tasks that as a solopreneur or business owner, you probably did do those and were the only person who could do those at a certain point in your business. But now that your company has grown and you have revenue, does it really make sense for you to be sitting down and doing the social media calendar? I also like to think about what are the tasks that someone else could get 80% of the way done that maybe I'm not looking for them for a finished product, but I can do the last 20%. So can Melissa draft my email newsletter and get it to 80% complete where my time process is now sped up significantly and it has cleared the mental clutter of, oh, geez, I have to sit down and write a whole email newsletter, right? So those are some different types of tasks and ways to think about this as you're starting to outsource to people. Yeah, I love that. What can someone else get 80% done for you so that you can come in at the, at the very end? So if it doesn't make you money, if it takes a lot of time or you hate it. <laughs> <laughs> get it, get rid of it. Don't stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. And so the piece about if I hate it, do I really need to delegate it? As a psychologist, I'm going to tell you, that's probably the first thing that you need to delegate because in my favorite story, in my experience was bookkeeping. You know, I hung on to bookkeeping so long because I, I thought, what if they mess it up? Or what if, you know, they can't possibly understand all the nuances of what's going on here. And I would always inevitably put it off till Friday afternoon. I would end up working like the or worse. I wouldn't do it on Friday afternoon because I was too tired. And I would end up doing it on Sunday. And like who wants to spend their Sunday doing bookkeeping? I don't. And I find when I finally delegated it, I realized I had been doing things wrong. There were some inaccuracies that I was really glad I caught. And the point where I knew I was just out of my comfort zone totally was when the payroll was involved. I was like, I'm done. Because I had someone who was supporting me in the background and telling me how to do it. And, and every quarter we were checking on it. And there was all, there were always mistakes that she was having me correct. And I just thought, this is crazy. Why am I torturing myself like this? And so what that does, though, is there's a lot of mental energy that goes into avoiding the task and not enjoying it. And then even afterwards thinking, gosh, do I have to do that again next month or next week? And so if we can remove that mental drain it really frees us up to focus on higher level things in the business. And one of the most common objections I get, Laura, when we're telling business owners, let it go, just let it go, get someone else to do this, is I want to save money. <laughs> No, but you're not saving money, right? So you just talked about one cost that a lot of people don't, which is the mental energy. There is a mental tax of you having this, even in the back of your mind, even when you do that bookkeeping once a week and you go, all right, it's done for this week. At least I don't have to think about it for six more days. It's in there. It's clutter. It's stressing you out. It's not helping you show up in the most effective way for the $10,000 an hour tasks that you really need to be sharp for. And so a lot of times too, 
too, we under, like we overestimate. We're like, well, bookkeeping takes me 10 hours and I do it once a week. You could bring in a bookkeeper and give them your guidelines. And they might say, I have a system. I have the software. This is how we save time. And it takes me two hours a week. And you might go, oh, I did this for so long. I I put so many hours in and someone else is faster. They're better. (laughs) And so always allow for that. It's very possible that you will discover that, that you will save money by outsourcing to someone else when they know what they're doing. Absolutely. And that's the biggest benefit is you're hiring an expert who has systems and who does this day in and day out. They live, breathe and sleep in it. So they're going to be better at it than you are. And that for me in going from solopreneur to building a team has been one of my greatest learnings is bring in people for the specific area of expertise that's needed who are better at it than me and let the company grow through their strengths. And it's my job to get out of the way and let it happen. Happen. So I know you have a gift that you want to share with us that just ties right in. I want to give you the opportunity to talk about this, Laura. Yeah. So if you're feeling overwhelmed and what business owner isn't, if they haven't started outsourcing yet, so it's sort of like a PDF to get you, get those creative juices flowing about what kinds of things could I outsource specifically to a virtual assistant. And usually that unlocks the floodgates of, oh, wow, there's a lot of things I could outsource. So it's at tinyurl.com slash 70 tasks VA as in virtual assistant. And it's 70 different tasks that you could potentially get off your plate and things that VAs tend to specialize in just to get you kind of convinced that there are things you're doing, right? Because that's another common objection is, well, yeah, there may be things that I could outsource, but I can do it. So why would I outsource it? And it's that it just because you can doesn't mean that you should. So start really adding up all these little things that you're doing that aren't making you money, are time consuming, are not your zone of genius. Like that's when you start to go, okay, how much could I get back in cleared mental space or actual hours per week by giving it to a freelancer and knowing that I'm still going to get a good end result? Yeah. Okay, Laura. So I want you to give that link one more time, please. Absolutely. So it is tinyurl.com slash seven zero tasks. VA. So like 70 tasks VA. Okay. Tinyurl.com forward slash 70 tasks VA. I love that. So for those of you who have been looking at that chart of $10,000 an hour activities and thinking, oh my gosh, I want to get to my $10,000 activities. Well, now you have a list of 70 tasks <laughs> that Laura is giving you to really get the brainstorming going of what you can free up and get off your plate. And just by way of example, I was speaking with one of our clients this week in our Better Business, Better Life program, and we were doing her leadership strategy session. And I said, tell me, you know, how many hours a week are you working currently and what are your biggest challenges? And she said, it's that I'm still working more than I want to. And I'm having time, a hard time finding time to work on the business to really grow it. And so we dug in and as we were going through things, it was really clear that she was still checking email and responding to email, even though she had been away. And when she was away, she had delegated that to someone else. But when she came back, it came back to her. And I said, let's figure this out because clearly you don't need to be the one doing this. And as we went through and looked at what's possible, getting that off her plate would free up at least 10 hours a week. So just, I want everyone to think about that. Like there's something, I know everyone is doing something in the business now that if it were delegated would free up five to 10 hours a week. So if you want to take your life back, go get this list of 70 tasks and start brainstorming what you can take off your plate that would free up five to 10 hours of your week. That's my challenge. I know those of you who are watching live, I would love to hear from you in the comments what you're coming up with that you could let go of that would free up five to 10 hours of your week. Laura, I appreciate you being here with us and being part of the conversation. I also want to invite you and those who are watching this live, if you're not part of our Entrepreneurs Take Your Life Back group yet, come join us because that's what we are always talking about over there is how to take your life back from your business, how to build a business that supports you in having a great lifestyle We believe work supports life, not the other way around. And what Laura has been sharing today from multiple angles, from, you know, hiring freelancers to being a freelancer, the opportunities that are out there are huge and you can have a business that supports your life. So Laura, as we wrap up, I would love to hear from you. 
one of your greatest lessons in life around work supports life? Oh my goodness. Well, you know, there's time that we can just never get back. Right. And I think we feel that the most when we lose a family member or a friend and and they pass away. And so I am all about how can I make sure that as much of my day is memorable and special and isn't about work, right? Like, so my work is there to enable me to do these other things, but you never know when that will become so helpful. You know, my father-in-law passed away in December of 2019 and the year before my husband and I had really carved out a nice long vacation time. We took both my in-laws to Key West to renew their vows on the beach where they had met 42 years before. And in that moment, when we lost him, there was not one ounce of regret that we carved that time that we both built careers where we could take that away, where we could pay for that. We could prioritize that. And so it's about those moments because you will never regret doing it, but you may absolutely regret not doing that and not making that a priority. So whatever those, whatever, whoever the VIPs are in your life, making time for them and for the things that you love is, is so important and it's definitely worth it. And there's no reason not to do it, right? We don't have to live in overwhelm and overwork anymore. So I really strive to help other people build businesses like that too. Thank you so much for sharing that. That it's such a powerful reminder. So thank you so much for being with us, Laura. Yeah. Thank you. If you're loving the Profit by Design podcast and have gotten any value out of it for your business or your life, would you mind doing two things? Subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode and please leave us a review. Our listener reviews help us get into the top 10 of all entrepreneurship podcasts so that more entrepreneurs like you discover us. Your review is critical in helping us make a difference for more entrepreneurs who are ready to take their life back.